Hi, everybody. Wow, that's loud. OK. Um, welcome to DevOps Days 2015. Um, thank you all for coming. I've got a couple of logistic items that we're going to get out of the way. But first of all, I just want to thank you all for showing up. Um, I want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, I'm going to run through them all because we couldn't do any of this without them. Uh, so I really want to call out our platinum sponsors, IBM, New Relic, Chef, Puppet, Microsoft, and Show Me. Our venue sponsor and our party sponsor for this evening, HP. Our gold sponsors, PagerDuty, Victor Ops, Blended Perspectives, Shopify, Ansible, VM Farms, and Sonotype. Our, and a last minute addition, actually, Pivotal Labs. Uh, silver sponsors, Mercatus, Scalar, and Sumo Logic. Our media sponsors, Uberflip and O'Reilly. And our community partner, FITC uh, in Toronto. Um, so, just a quick outline. I'm going to run through the first items of the day. Then we'll have a talk. We're going to have a couple talks today, four talks in total. We're going to have Ignite talks. Um, and then we break open to, we break out into open spaces. Um, we've got a great party lined up for you this evening. Uh, we're going to be using uh, most of the venue, except the auditorium. Uh, we've got games, music, drinks, food. Uh, of course, I didn't silence my phone. Um, we've got giveaways. We've got a job board. Um, we've got... Uh, Twitter, make sure that you tweet hashtag DevOps Days um, and join the conversation. Half of the conference is on Twitter, uh, and it's really important to sort of engage everybody you can, and that's the best way to do it. You know, there's a lot of people here. It's really difficult to meet everyone, and it's really difficult to keep track of who's who and who said what and who's from where. Twitter is the best way, I promise you. Um, so, Quick question for the audience. How many people is it your first time coming to DevOps Days, any DevOps Days? Wow, amazing. Um, I'm always amazed. Every DevOps Days I go to, and I go to quite a few, it's amazing how many new people show up. And, and we're very, very happy to have you. You're the reason why this conference series is exploding all over the world. Uh, and we really appreciate everybody coming and, and sharing this with us. Uh, so um, this is all about you guys. It's not about all of us who go to every DevOps days. You know, um, it's about bringing new people in and trying to share and teach and, and grow and learn from all the new blood. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for buying tickets. Thank you for showing up. Um, so last year, uh, we had 180 people. We sold out three times. This year, we're more than double. We sold out at 385. Um, and that's as many people as we could possibly fit in here. Uh, we've got people coming in still at this point. So it might get a little bit cozy, but it, I think we'll be OK. Um, let's see. We've got. Uh, OK, so how many people are from outside Toronto? Not bad, not bad, okay. It's actually good, we got a big local crowd. Um, how many people were with us last year? Wow, not, not that many, all right. <laughs> oh. Hopefully we fixed everything that drove off all the uh, dissenters. Uh, we do have more comfortable chairs, you'll notice. Um, so, uh, how many people consider themselves dev in the audience? Oh, well, big portion, okay. How many ops? Okay. How many uh, IT? All right. How many recruiters in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> You're all recruiting. Come on, everyone's hiring. You're joking me. Okay. Um, how many people are here with their team? Excellent, excellent. That's awesome. Yeah, we just 
team tickets was something we did this year. We didn't do it last year. It was probably one of the best decisions we made. Um, it's awesome to see so many teams show up because DevOps Days is amazing with a team. You know, you're going to be showing up maybe on different pages. You're going to leave on the same page. Uh, it's a great team building exercise. Open spaces are amazing with teams. You guys can divide and conquer and then reconvene or you can try not to dominate an entire session. Uh, but we'll work it out. So I think that's it for my survey questions. I'm going to bring out my team because I want to I want to show all the effort that went into this. Um, there's nine of us in total. We're missing one because he's actually covering the registration desk right now for stragglers. Um, but let's bring those guys out, and I will I will introduce them if they're actually listening. They are amazing. All right, so we have Eric Levinson. You gotta raise your hand. Bruce Martins. Fozzie Mana. Chris Little. Martin Cleaver. A beer made it from the registration desk. And Philippe Tremblay. Awesome. This is everybody. Oh, and Dave. Oh, Dave's running the registration. Dave's in the back. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Uh, OK, awesome. So uh, let's see. Feel free to drop by the registration desk if you have any questions. Feel free to grab any of us if you have questions. Um, we've got plenty of staff. There's wait staff out uh, from Onville who will help you with anything around refreshments or food. Um, We've got Wi-Fi, hopefully you've noticed. Oh, that was good timing, almost. Um, apparently, it's pretty good. So, I mean, don't test that, but be gentle, but it should be, it should be pretty decent. Um, can we have a round of applause uh, on the Wi-Fi level so far? It, nobody likes the Wi-Fi. Nobody, it's not working for anybody? All right, okay. It's about conference level Wi-Fi then, okay. I thought, it'd be, I thought it'd be good. All right. So we've got washrooms um, along the side here. We've got washrooms in the conference center. I'm not sure if the conference center is open, but basically, if you're worried about space in the reception area, um, we do have room to eat. Uh, we'll be opening up the conference center if it's not open, and there's plenty of seating in there. So for lunch, for snacks, feel free to filter out into the conference area. There's plenty of room and seating there. We have the code of conduct. If you're not familiar, um, it's what everybody checked the box on during their registration. Uh, head to the website if you don't know it off by heart. It's really important. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone here feels safe, happy, relaxed, and has a great time, and, and feels able to share and communicate with everyone, because that's what it's all about. So I think with that, I'm right at 10.15. And uh, I'm going to bring on our first speaker, our wonderful keynote speaker, J. Paul Reed. There you go. Applause brings him out. Uh, I'm on my way, I promise. I will steal that. All right. This is the fun. Uh, set up the laptop part of the show. And where's the audio? Oh, there it is. All right. Okie doke. How are we, how we doing this morning? Yay. Come on, are we not awake yet? Is that, is that the issue? All right, so this is uh, hacking the CXO code, your CIO, CTO, CEO code. Um, as Steve said, I'm Paul Reed. Uh, this slide's really about the Twitter, my Twitter name, so if you want to like tweet things at me, tweet tomatoes at me, um, you know, tweet but actually is at me, that's cool. Uh, Sober Build Inge on Twitter. There's a story actually about the nickname Sober Build Inge, which I will uh, handily tell you uh, in the bar, it's cool. 
so uh, I also uh, host with a bunch of really awesome people the Ship Show. You can check us out, Ship Show Podcast, on Twitter uh, and at theshipshow.com. Those are the co-hosts. They're, they're super awesome. Um, so this is, uh, this is the, uh, I skipped a slide. This is the uh, first or second time I've been in Toronto. Um, and I feel right at home, maybe a little bit too, too much at home last night. I was like, oh, yeah, that's Canada. I need a data plan, an international data plan. So I was on the plane trying to get, get, a, get a data plan so quickly. Um, so anyway, my background, I, I always like to point this out, is uh, as a build release engineer. This is actually me a number of years ago in my build release cave at Mozilla. We were shipping a, a version of the browser. Uh, so my background started in the trenches, um, shipping software. Uh, but in the last few years, I moved to sort of doing consulting, and it's like, you know, started doing more of these, yeah, so what kind, what kind of DevOps do you do here, you know? It's like, I take the commits from the developers to the servers, that's what I do, you know, having those conversations. Um, so it's been a real shift in, in sort of uh, the people that I talk to and the people that I spend my time with. Um, a lot of the conversations these days center around like, how does that make you feel? Which makes me feel a bit like a therapist, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so I've been in a lot of meetings with, uh, I found myself in a lot of meetings with CIOs, CTOs, sometimes CEOs of companies, and they would be talking about DevOps, and they would be using that word, but it'd be like, I think they're talking about DevOps, but maybe they're talking about something else entirely. It was like this new vocabulary, and there was like, two levels of the conversation going on that I had to sort of learn what, what was actually be happening in the room. Um, there, were, there was the conversation that you could hear and then there, there was the actual conversation that was going on. So that was a new skill for me coming from an engineering background. So what I realized is I'm having a different conversation than we generally have when we talk about DevOps or DevOps days, an event like this. So the genesis of this talk was, well, um, if you're involved in sort of a cultural change or a DevOps transformation, as they often like to call it, um, you have to be aware of those conversations at, at different levels of the business. A lot of times it's not just about uh, what tools your team is interested in. Uh, we talk a lot about the value stream, right, and, and all the different parts of the business. So you have to start to think about these things. And uh, I, I don't know if my mom originally said this quote, but she used to tell me, you know, to change the world, you have to understand and accept the world as it currently is. So, you know, the point of that being that you have to understand the dynamics in play before you can go into somebody's office and be like, hey, let's go do the DevOps. And that's really what this talk is about. Um, another way of saying this might be uh, if you can't beat them, join them. So what's interesting is that, uh, you know, we go, we go into the business a lot of times and, and they have simple questions like, just please explain to me what exactly is DevOps? And a lot of times, and, and I found myself uh, giving explanations that sounded kind of like this. To live and to live in a mystery and to find purpose and to live in the now Magic! <sighs> now! <laughs> so, okay, and, and, and they're like, well, okay, that's great. Uh, what specific things, I hear tools and culture, we talk about tools and culture, what specific things would we do? I want specific examples of how we can bring tools in, change our culture. And then we give answers kind of like this. Live in the moment. Don't get old. Don't judge people. Because you can't be free if you judge people. Love now. Create. Inspire. So, at this point, you know, you tell a VP of engineering that, and they're like, um, okay. So, what type of capabilities, if we invest all this effort, will we have? And then we sort of sound like this. 
Whoa! Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, oh my god! Whoa! Oh! Wow! Woo! Yeah! Oh my! Oh my! Oh my god! Look at that! It's starting to even look like a triple rainbow. Oh my god, it's full on double rainbow all the way across the sky. <laughs> oh my god. So, so at this point, they're kind of like, really? <laughs> and, and can you blame them? You know, a lot of times what we're talking about, it just sounds like kind of this weird gibberish. Um, I wanted to point out, I, I went and looked at uh, a bunch of DevOps Days presentations in the previous years, and I just posted the titles. And these are from various events all over the world. And some of them are like, like if you were to look at them, it's like, it makes no sense. What we're talking about, the, the coming donkey apocalypse, like what's going on there? <laughs> Cybernetics to DevOps and beyond, I, maybe, I don't know. Cognitive neuroscience of empathy, we talk a lot about empathy, right? DevOps equals 42, that one's my fault actually. Um, what does that mean, right? Uh, and, and part of the problem is, you know, why you're destroying DevOps. Some of this is pretty, not, pretty hostile. What, I'm destroying DevOps now? There is no talent shortage. You tell, you tell a, a manager or an executive that, like, that directly conflicts with their experience in the world, uh, even though there's a whole presentation from uh, Andrew Schaefer on this. So there's really, like, kind of a, a huh going on here. Uh, this is a quote from the Phoenix Project. I'll tell, I'll tell you what I need from you. I need the business to tell me it's no longer being held hostage by your IT guys. This has been the running complaint the entire time I've been CIO. Uh, we, can't, we can't even take a crap without IT being in the way. So this is something that we need to think about because the business often feels like this. It's, um, you know, whether or not it's true, uh, we talk about tools and culture, and, and this is what they feel like. It's like, oh, it's just, I mean, I'm tired of hearing the DevOps. I just have to clean up after the mess. So we're going to talk about some strategies and information you need to know so you can hack or maybe convince your CTO, your CIO, your CIO, CEO. Um, now you might say, oh, my CEO reads Forbes and CIO magazine and is on board with the DevOps. Um, but they might think DevOps is Docker or Chef or some tool, or they might think it's continuous delivery. Um, and even if they think that these tools are going to be helpful in sort of um, uh, making the argument and having those conversations with them about what it actually means. Um, so you're not doing it in a way where you're like, DevOps, <laughs> you know. So first up, so we're going to talk three areas, stories, monies, and tools. So we talk a lot, I mentioned empathy in the DevOps space, we talk a lot about empathy. Uh, I did a number of interviews with executives for this presentation, and I thought one of the things that was interesting, one of them said, one of the things that always stresses me out at conferences is this recurring theme of the leadership team not getting it, they won't support it, or isn't doing the right thing. Uh, which I, I thought is pretty interesting because this isn't a very empathetic standpoint. Um, a room full of us, even though we seem pretty unassuming, can actually be pretty um, nerve-wracking to someone who's trying to figure it out, especially in sort of a leadership role. Um, up until probably a year ago, maybe two years ago, a year and a half, we, there was a lot of uh, making fun of the enterprise. Uh, and now there's like enterprise DevOps and people will say that and sometimes giggle. Um, that's not very empathetic either, but it's interesting that, that we had that sort of period in the, the um, DevOps movement, as it were. So uh, another uh, quote that uh, another executive said, you know, the journey for me was understanding the capability, what ops is capable of while we're still dealing with what ops currently is. And there's this interesting notion that uh, the, the primary concern there is operations, not in a ops staff, but like business operations while they're innovating. And a lot of times, the, our perspectives are a bit reversed. You know, we we want to look at like what are the new features of the next version of the product, what are the cool new tools we can play with. Um, but this is really what they spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, there's a book uh, in The Art of Action by Stephen Bungay. He talks about and points out that uh, in time of war, even the simplest things become very difficult to do. Um, and, and a lot of times, uh, especially 
if you're in a competitive business space, it, it feels like that. It feels like a war zone. So that's what they're sort of thinking of. So when you tell stories about DevOps, when you try to convince uh, executives that this is the way to go, uh, you really have to include some uh, important aspects to that story that you tell. Obvious, the first question is cost. What does cost look like? We're going to dissect that a little more in a second. Um, we talk about the value chain all the time, the value stream. Uh, and we usually think the value stream of like code commits to customer value, right? But they're thinking about, you know, if I have to roll this out in an enterprise full of 200 people, maybe that's not an enterprise, 500 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people, what does that look like? What does that value stream actually look like? Or value streams, as it were. Safe to fail rollout. How, you know, how can I roll this technology out um, and scale Docker, for instance, from you know, the two people, uh, two developers and their desktop to you know, all of our servers and our server farm? Um, you know, I really liked uh, one of the people I talked to uh, talked about potential energy. And it was like, uh, do they, does it add potential energy to the system or does it subtract potential energy system, this, this thing that you're proposing, whether it's a tool or a cultural change, um, how, what does that look like? Um, and you might ask yourself, well, why is this a story? Why do I have to tell a story, right? Why do I have to construct a narrative? And it turns out because the person that you're talking to, that manager, that executive, is going to have to tell that story in the executive leadership committee. They're, if, if they're a VP of engineering, they might have, in, in your development, they might have to tell that story to their IT operations person and get them on board. So the point is, the reason that it's a story is because we all uh, understand how stories work and, and uh, the components of a story and sort of what to expect out of that. And so it's a quick and dirty way to, to sort of talk about how you roll things out without having to talk about all the details. So that's why it becomes a narrative story as opposed to, well, we're going to use Docker and then we're going to get everyone Docker Hub accounts. And then, right, that's, that's not actually interesting because it, it doesn't allow that story to be retold throughout the business. Now, I, I mentioned cost. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, when the executive that I was talking to kind of brought up, it's like something as simple as cost is not just like, hey, do we have licenses for it? You know, do we need consultants? As a consultant, the answer is always yes. You need consultants. Um, but licensing, right? Software licensing, um, training. It, and that was actually a, a really big aspect of the conversation that I heard repeated over and over again, is if you're going to be rolling out a particular technology, is it like you and someone else on your team, and that's the only two people that know the technology? Um, this whole bit of like we're actually, right? Remember, they care about operations first. So the big question in their mind is like, well, how do I get the rest of the team to be able to support this? We talk a lot about non-functional requirements in DevOps, things like, oh, the site should load quickly. What does that mean, right? This is a non-functional requirement that our team can actually operate this tool, you know, can write chef recipes, can write puppet manifests, that sort of thing. Um, it's kind of funny. It's like we should have more people than Brent who knows how this works. That's like a requirement, a, a non-functional requirement. So, Let's take containers as an example of this, and by which I mean, of course, Docker, or uh, Docker, Docker, Docker. Um, and the question is like, well, you know, I, and I went through this exercise uh, with an executive as an example, and, and the question was like, well, how would we use it? Are we going to put everything in a Docker container? And there's an interesting uh, Velocity presentation, I believe it was, from uh, Bridget Cromhout, who was like, we discovered you don't want to put everything in a Docker container. That's actually bad. But knowing that is really important. Details like that. How are we going to support it, right? Who do I call if it blows up at 3 a.m. and the site is down and the CEO is calling me, the CIO? Um, the plan for rolling out. Uh, Nick Galbraith at DevOps Days Austin had a really funny quote. He's, it's like the, the second law of ops dynamics, ops thermodynamics. It's like operational pain is never destroyed, it's just moved around. Um, and and it, was, it, it spurred a really interesting conversation with John Willis because uh, th there was this debate about, well, developers love Docker because they can just build a Docker container and then they shove it to ops and then ops just runs it. And it's like, well, that's great, but how do I recreate it? And then it turned into this weird release engineering and configuration management discussion, which was very spirited, as conversations with John Willis often are. And these are the exact sort of conversations that if you go in and have them in front of an executive, you're not helping your case because it means you haven't thought through all of these things. You don't have a story, a narrative to address them. Um, it's kind of funny, we talk a lot about uh, systems thinking. 
uh, and you know starts with dev to ops and then scales out from there. There's a big focus on that. And that's what people with VP and C level titles have to think about. That's why they're asking us these weird questions. There's an interesting post uh, from uh, Dan McKinley about, uh, and he was an engineer at Etsy, about choose boring technology. Um, it's definitely worth a read. And, and it was interesting, the upshot was like, you know, it's not about uh, having, uh, choosing boring technology so we can have cogs in, in a wheel and move people around freely. It's more like uh, we want to free up people's time so they can do more interesting things than figuring out why their Cassandra cluster crapped itself for the fourth time this week, uh, which uh, a colleague of mine was dealing with. Right? So they use boring stuff like MySQL and PHP. Uh, not very sexy technology, but it gets the job done, and there are a lot of people uh, that know that technology, and that's comforting. Um, some interesting quotes in some of the other ethnographic research that I did with executives. Um, you know, when you're talking about this story, they're talking about, you want to talk about potential future states, not current problems. So a lot of times we complain, well, you know, those ops engineers, they, they just don't want to change any version of anything, and the developers always want to change a site. This is really annoying. Uh, leaders don't want to hear that. Because uh, it doesn't really, you know, it's just noise at this point. Um, so they want to, uh, how the part of the story that's important is, is what do I get out of this change? Another interesting one was stay within a sphere of influence or control. If you go in and say, well, I want to change everything about how all, all the developers and uh, ops people do their work, that's a really hard sell. Um, there, was, there was an interesting uh, quote he was saying, it's like, don't come in to me and complain about other teams. I don't want to hear that, right? Talk about what you can actually do within your team and prove that that's a win and that I can support you and, and actually uh, roll that out to other teams or at least have that conversation with other teams. Um, again, talk about how it could be uh, sort of future focused as opposed to these are the, the problems with our current state. Um, and, you know, I, I put this last one in. If the story that you tell answers why is it the right direction, again, People at that level are worried about strategy, right? So they, they care about things in the story about is this the right direction for like this company for the next two years? That's the time scale on which they think about these things. Not Docker seems really cool. Uh, maybe we should deploy that and see if it works out. Um, there's an interesting quote. Uh, if you want to champion something, the thing that's necessary for success is that you, you aren't necessary for its success. So that's something to think about. I think a lot of times, and I've, I've been guilty of this, certainly we go in and we say, hey, this is really cool technology, and you don't explain how uh, you aren't necessary for its success in the org. Um, he put it this way, this is how you and the organization, you want to explain, this is how you and the organization are not exposed if we roll this out, if we leave uh, or get uninterested in or frankly get bus factored. So let's talk a little bit about money. Money. So, interesting thought experiment. There's two stocks. Which stock would you rather buy? Pretty much everyone would probably want the top stock. So what's, what's interesting about this, now imagine if they were budgets. If this were your budget for the year, what would that look like? Which budget would you rather have? And this leads us to a discussion about there are two buckets from which money comes from. And if you've ever had to deal with budgeting, you probably know they are uh, capital expenditures and op operational expenditures. And this is where most tech people, myself included, sort of glaze over because it's boring. But so capital expenditure things like qu equipment, we're going to buy a new factory, we're going to buy a new robot to run in the factory. Um, we're, you know, uh, operational expenditures are things like office supplies, copiers, you know, toner, things like that that aren't really related to the bit insurances in there for some reason. But the important part that I want to point out is salaries turn out to be in this. So product development salaries, engineers that build widgets, design widgets, that's CapEx. Sales, people that sell it, that's OpEx. Well, this is why we care. Traditionally, developers are put in the capital expenditure budget, and us ops people, if you are an ops person, are in the operational budget. So that model that I showed you before, I based that off of, this is a standard, you know, just assume year revenue, yearly revenue, this is what it looks like, and there's ups and downs, right? But one of them is how it gets accounted for in the budget if it's a capital expense versus an operational expense. And that huge dive is an operational expense. Why do you care? Well, if you're talking about, hey, we want to roll out Chef, and we thought this is the right thing, or Docker, or Puppet, or whatever it is, but we know we're going to have to get licenses, we're going to have to do training, we're going to have to expend maybe $10 million. In the accounting, this actually matters. Does it go in the OpEx budget? Does it go in the CapEx budget? 
Now, what's interesting about DevOps is if you start talking about infrastructure as code, we're developing these parts of our product, is that a capability? Is that part of our product experience? Well, if it is, then we can actually make the argument that operations is now a capital expenditure, and it, we can have that nice smooth curve that doesn't look like this cliff that we spent a ton of money. That's really attractive to the business, because they don't like seeing those big cliffs in the revenue charts. Investors, it turns out, don't either. So what's interesting about this cloud thing is, you know, when we buy a bunch of servers, that would be a capital expenditure when you rack them up. But then after a while, they become an operational expenditure because uh, it's part of the operating budget. But then the question becomes, well, we've, we're doing all this, like, move to cloud thing. What do you think it should be? Is that an OpEx budget or is it a CapEx budget? Now, what's interesting about this is it tends to get accounted for as an operational expense. And then you get that weird cliff again. But you can make the argument, if we're just purchasing servers in the cloud, but they're not on-site, on on-prem, uh, you can actually make the argument to an accountant that it should be capital, and then you get it back in that happy budget. Now, uh, I'm not a tax attorney, uh, so don't like, go start messing with budgets um, and, and thinking that it's totally, you should definitely consult uh, your finance people. Um, but it's important to understand uh, the personality of your budgeting process. Um, the cycles, when does the budgeting process start? When does the budgeting process end? What are the key dates? Things like that. Because obviously, if you go in and ask your manager at the end of a budget cycle for $10 million, they're probably not going to give it to you. But they might give it to you if you asked a month later at the beginning of the new cycle. Um, there's an interesting story about spending limits. I was talking with an executive, and, and she was saying that um, she used to get laptops that were all tricked out because she wanted to get, for her team, because she wanted to get the laptop over $2,000 because that was her spending limit. But if she got the laptop over $2,000, it had to get approved, which was kind of annoying, but the money came out of somebody else's budget, and that mattered, right? They have some magical IT budget that laptops fall out of the sky from. So knowing the source of your money is actually an important thing. And again, it seems kind of boring, but it's something that we have to know if we're going to have this conversation in a way that, that is compelling. So what's interesting is a lot of times you should just know, you know the size of the budget. Sometimes the capital expense budget is really huge. Sometimes it turns out the operational expense budget is really huge. You just need to know what they are so you can at least think about that and have that conversation. So then you can tell a credible story about how you can most effectively use it. Your team can most effectively use it. All right, last section, tools. So who's heard of this book, Phoenix Project? Ooh, good, okay. So if you haven't read it, you should definitely go read it. Now, hands went up. Who's read it? Okay, who's read it twice? Okay, good. Okay, this is interesting. All right, so I recently read it again, and what I found that was interesting is if you haven't read it twice, by the way, if you haven't read it, you should read it. If you haven't read it twice, you should read it again. And the reason is, I don't know about you, but when I first read it, I was like, oh, this is kind of painful because this is my life. But it's so well written that uh, we focus a lot on the characters. We're like, who's this crazy Willy Wonka Eric guy that comes in and like says a bunch of stuff and then leaves? Um, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, oh crap, am I Brent? Um, we, so it's such a well-written narrative, which is kind of a, a, a trick about it, that we often forget aspects of the book that talk about what the business wants. And it turns out they're in about the last third half of the book, but at that point I'm so angry at Sarah getting involved in the process, I'm just like, ugh, I hate that character. So I didn't really pay attention to this. But the book talks about you know, three ways of DevOps. We know a lot of those. We, we hear a lot of talking about that. But four types of IT work, anyone remember that one? There's a whole section on interviews with the business. And, and there's a bit, like, there's a whole chapter on the financial model of the Phoenix Project, where they come to the conclusion, we never should have done the Phoenix Project. But I don't know about you, I glossed over that part because I was so enthralled in the characters. But this is the stuff the business cares about. This is the conversation the business cares about. So you should take a weekend and read it again and look at this stuff. Uh, specifically, because that's where a lot of the interesting meat that I know I missed on the first read is. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, about tools. Phoenix Project was one. Kanban, who does Kanban? Who knows what it is? Yeah, good. Kanban is, is pretty uh, getting really popular for operations type work, which is awesome. Um, this is the Kanban game. Dominica de Grandis uses it for training. Uh, I've, I've done, used it for training. Uh, what's really fun is if you play this game with executives, 
uh, or leaders, managers, right? Because the first thing you do is you realize that uh, the uh, investigate, the project management people have a couple of dice that they can roll, developers have three, and then the ops person has one. And if you put a development manager playing the ops role, they're like, why, why do they have three dice and I have one? And that makes it very clear very quickly what the problem is. I've actually seen executives or, or uh, leaders, you know, managers and VPs play this game, and, and it's really fun when you put like QA people as the developers and developers as the QA people and just let that play itself out because it turns out it's really funny. Um, so the whole point of Kanban is to make the work visible. Like that's the reason we do it. But it turns out when you play this game with leaders, it, they get insight, especially if you let leaders play it or let leaders watch the teams playing it, they get insight into what work looks like within their specific system. They have that epiphany about, oh, the work gets stuck in the ops column because there's literally one person serving 15 developers in my particular instance, maybe. So what's interesting about this training is, uh, you know, this is a Kanban board, obviously. Um, it led to interesting conversations with the team. They did an express lane, and there was an executive there named Shane. They actually called their express lane the Shane lane because this executive would come and ask for things, like, I need this expedited. It needs to happen today. And the reason they did that, and he thought it was kind of funny and kitschy, oh, it's the Shane lane, ha, huh? that means it's important, right? But they used it to make the argument that every time the Shane lane gets used, all of the work we're doing just gets exploded. And that was re a realization for him about maybe I think a bit more about what, I, what work I expedite. So Kanban is great, you should use it, but this is the real interesting part from a leadership perspective that once that it makes the work visible to them, they can have that aha moment that's, that actually helps you manage the work by getting stuff out of that expedite line. So talking about the DevOps, uh, there's a lot of tendency uh, to like bring it up at, at meetings or you know, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna do DevOps at a meeting, maybe a strategy meeting, maybe even within our teams, you know, get the developers and ops people together and talk about let's do the DevOps. It's interesting, I worked, once worked at a client where um, they had a, what they called the weekly DevOps meeting and the DevOps team had a meeting with the developers and the ops people which there's a number of anti-patterns in that statement, uh, but that was their meeting, and it was not a very pleasant meeting uh, to attend. Um, I talked with Kevin Baer, who's one of the authors of uh, The Phoenix Project, and he was saying that um, really uh, having informal conversations around the water cooler is cliche. There's like a Dilbert cartoon, but uh, it allows us to actually have a number of interesting conversations with people in ways that they are very low risk. We talk about risk to the business, but a lot of times people talk, forget that there's risk to people's reputations, uh, risk possibly to, to people's budgets if, if they do something and they were wrong, right? This is a low risk way that's not the pageantry of a meeting. It doesn't commit people to things. It's an easy way to probe the organization and see how much immune response there is to something like Docker or a Kanban board or whatever uh, you might be proposing. Um, what's, what is interesting about the way Kevin framed this is he said what you want to do is give them new information about something they already want to do. That conversation is a lot easier to have than, hey, I want to convince you to do the DevOps. So it's really important when you're having these conversations to understand the, the constraints and the degrees of freedom that even senior executives have. I think a lot of times we think, oh, they can do whatever they want. They're the leader of the company. It turns out they are constrained in ways that are generally very opaque to us. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for that, right? These are complex businesses or complex adaptive systems just like our IT operations are when we, when we run things, right? So what was interesting is, uh, this is actually a quote from Kevin. He was like, you know, a lot of times we forget the constraints, their constraints, the business constraints. And he said, we're hung up and, and frankly arrogant on what the technology is. That's where we, what we want to talk about, and we forget that there are some sort of constraints that are business constraints in the system, and we have to suss those out and figure out uh, what those are. Um, he suggested asking, asking a very interesting question. What would success feel like? You've got metrics that you want to deliver on for the year. What does that look like? What would it feel like at the end of the year? And once you know, excuse me, you know that, then you can actually have a credible conversation and weave that into the story you tell about why you want to do Docker, why you want to do okay, here's Kanban. 
So a uh, really interesting thing about uh, Skunk Works DevOps, should you do uh, a Skunk Works project? I actually got mixed feedback on that about whether or not you should or shouldn't do Skunk Works projects. Um, MacGyver DevOps projects. One executive said that's a warning sign for me if I hear about Skunk Works projects. Not for the reason you might think. The main reason that, the, that this person was worried about it is just that this, there was this work that was going on that may actually have been use, useful, but he was more like, it, it, it was, um, was disappointing that people would feel like they had to hide that work. Um, what you really want, the reason Skunk Works projects can be good though is because they are low risk, they're low investment, they're kind of duct taped together, which is fine, but they pr they're a proof of concept, which is useful. So the real takeaway there is, how, how can you have a Skunk Works project that actually isn't necessarily Skunk Works? How can you convince, hey, I should be, you know, our team should dedicate 10% or 20% to Docker so we can actually give you the answers you want. And if you know what they want from a business perspective at the end of the year, then they're much more likely to allow you to run that experiment, these safe to fail experiments that we talk about a lot. So I'll leave you with a couple of interesting quotes from uh, Dr. Nicole Frosgren. She works at Chef. She worked on the DevOps survey. Um, she was saying, uh, to us, to technology people, it's important to understand the strategy, the context, and the value that's important to your organization, and then how do you play into those. And this is the most key, important key point. Until you take the time to sit down and understand that, DevOps, for the sake of DevOps, does not matter. This is the problem that ALM and Agile fell into. She actually said, you know, there's, there's a lot of, like, navel-gazing. Yeah, source control is great, but what value does it actually deliver? If you can make this argument, then, uh, and, and uh, uh, speak to that, that's what's important. She actually said, you know, the whole reason DevOps has had its success is because it provides value to the business. So once you can speak to that, once you get good at hacking your leaders, then you can mess with the best and DevOps like the rest. Thanks. So, one thing real quickly, if this is important, I want to give a special thanks, I, I, and you know who you are. I talked to a lot of, exec, of executives I can't name, but they were very forward with me. I did talk to Dr. Forsgren and Kevin Bear, so I want to thank them too. A lot of interesting insight there. A lot of people talking about things that are hard to talk about, that are risky to talk about, so I wanted to thank them. The other thing is I wrote a little book called DevOps in Practice. I have five copies with me. Um, if you tweet at me, I will put everybody's Twitter names in, in a thing and draw them out, and I will autograph them for you, and I'll announce that during open spaces. Probably on Twitter, I'll tweet you back. Cool. Yeah? Do we have time for like one or two questions? Yeah, we got a little bit of time. Okay. Um, do we have any uh, questions in the audience? We can run out a mic to you, and uh, if you've got any questions for Paul. Zero? People are like, oh, business. Oh, there we go. We're warming oh, up. Yeah. We're waking up. I'd be curious about how you define a Skunk Works DevOps project. Like, what level does it have to go up to in the organization before it no longer constitutes Skunk Works? That's a really good question. So I think in the interviews that I did, um, the, the level the concern and the use of the, the word Skunk Works had a connotation that was like Docker, let's say Docker. Uh, Docker got deployed as a Skunk Works project and by the time the CEO or CTO knows about it, half the organization is running it and the reason they know about it is because all the people supporting it and that knew anything about it left, right? And, and then it, they use, oh, that people say, oh, it's a Skunk Works project because now we're all screwed, right? And that's the context. So, it's very interesting, you bring up a really good point. How do you think about Skunk Works actually at the front end of, of the beginning of a project? Because by the time they see it, that's why it has that negative connotation. And that, by the way, was the, the difference between the two interviews I did. The one executive that was like, Skunk Works projects are yellow flags for me. That's because they were looking at the project after it had blown up because the organization somehow became reliant on it. Um, Kevin was talking about Skunk Works projects as safe to fail experiments. And this is, again, kind of a cognitive hacking thing. I would actually be open and talk about your Skunk Works project because, and make sure that the uh, connotation that's understood is that it's not, we're not committing to anything and you don't have to invest anything, but we're not hiding it from you. And that was, I think, the difference between the, the two people using the same term. That was actually really interesting when I did that interview. I was like, oh, these two people have very different views of that. I'm being very helpful. 
<laughs> Just... Hey, uh, can you tell me about that meeting you had with Dev, DevOps, and Ops? You said it was a painful meeting. Yes. Sh shouldn't so, they not be painful, or, or is so, pain part of the process? So the reason it was painful is because, so first of all, there was a DevOps team. So there was a tribe of, of developers and a tribe of operators or ops people. And uh, somebody came in, a leader came in and was like, we're going to do DevOps, by which I mean we're going to hire a whole other team and call it the DevOps team. So, so the reason the meeting was painful was like, well, let's bring all the developers in and let's bring all the ops people in. And then let's bring a third team in. So you have three tribes that are talking about shared territory. And there's a lot of like, well, who are you? And why are you here? Even six, nine months in, right? So the anti-pattern I was referring to is the DevOps team anti-pattern. Um, and there's a lot of debate about that. We can talk about that in an open space or something. But the point is, um, you know, a lot of this stuff, especially as you get higher up and having those conversations, turn out to be psychology and sociology. Right, organizational dynamics, and that was a, you know, we are out on the savanna, and there are three tribes that are being forced to come together and figure out how to hunt together, and they have different techniques and different priorities and different, you know, whatevers. And two tribes had a lot of history in that particular organization because they had been there since the beginning, and now there's this new DevOps tribe coming in saying you're doing everything wrong. That's why it was a painful conversation, because you just had these weird tribe, tribal, sociological things going on wrapped up in a technical argument. One more? Two more? Yeah, so How are we doing on time? One more. One, one more. more. All right. Yeah, we're actually we're good. Cool. Uh, first off, thanks for your talk. It was really good. Um, I'm kind of lucky that the business is at least open to the conversation. Um, I'm also uh, giving myself a little pat on the back because I'm already doing some of the things you suggested doing. Um, so I've become a victim of my own success. We're now one level deeper. So I'm going to See if you can give me some help on a tactical level. Business goes great. I get it. We'll be able to release faster, you know, harmony, happiness. So now what I need you to do is give me a plan by the end of the month, where are we going to be, how much faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, you know, can you please estimate how long it's going to take to boil the ocean? And they're looking for that kind of granular level estimates that we give when we're doing, say, like a three sprint dev project. Right. Because that's the, as far into agile and DevOps as they've gotten. Right. And, and I'm starting to feel like the, the dude in the, the video, right? Right. The chicken noises and stuff. Yeah. So um, do you have any suggestions at sort of the tactical level, how to get them to back off wanting to try and get this very heavy upfront prescriptive, you know, well, after six hours, we'll be 40 minutes faster. Right. right. Okay, that, so that's really good question, really hard problem. Um, so the way I would answer that is uh, Kevin uh, Bear, and, and uh, I work with Kevin, one of his big things is DevOps is emergent. So there's this weird dichotomy between I want you to, to give me a list of things you're going to do, figure it all out for our organization, and uh, give me a schedule like a Gantt chart, and then roll that out on something that's emergent, right? And uh, we, a lot, one of the big core tenets of what we talk about is that DevOps is different for every organization. So there's this big no estimates movement. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, I'd read up on that. There's a hashtag no estimates on Twitter. There's lots of actually arguments on Twitter about this. Um, but the whole point behind that is that if you are uh, figuring out what an entire uh, methodology like DevOps looks like for your organization, um, Kevin uses the word complex socio-technical systems. And I think that's really important. Um, complex adapti adaptive socio-technical systems. I forgot the adaptive part. Um, so the, the point is, is that you need to start sort of having that conversation actually about complexity and the fact that we have a lot of sort of baggage. You know, every organization has a lot of technical baggage, cultural baggage, however you want to uh, uh, talk about it. And reframe it from, this is not a project with a Gantt chart that I can give you a schedule. Reframe that to, something more like Toyota production system where it's a kata, where it's a continuous improvement thing, and we're doing lots of s uh, small safe to fail experiments. And we don't, so, so I could tell you what the next two experiments we're gonna run are, but I can't tell you what it looks like, you know, 12 weeks out or two sprints out or whatever. Um, and if you reframe that as uh, the reason you want small experiments is because it's low risk, then you can actually have that conversation as opposed to, well, I just want to run small experiments. <laughs> you know, Help, is that helpful? Yeah. Cool. All right, let's get one last round of applause for J. Paul Reed.
We're going to keep it going. I'm going to... Uh, and uh, we'll set them up. Good. All right. Now I'm going to take the mic off. So there's no I don't need that. <laughs>